What is going on, wonderful people? It's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to my pathology playlist. In previous videos, we talked about cell adaptations, cell injury, and cell death. We discussed atrophy, hypertrophy, hyperplasia, metaplasia, dysplasia, and neoplasia. Remember that neoplasias could be benign or malignant, i.e. cancerous. We covered cell injuries, such as hypoxia and the different types of hypoxia, and the difference between hypoxia and hypoxemia. Cell death could be apoptosis and necrosis. We have talked about all of this before. Then we started a series on acute inflammation and the inflammatory mediators and the cytokines, including the interleukins and more. We have talked about bradykinin in the previous video. Today it's time for histamine. Where does this name come from? Histamine. Histo means tissue, as in histology. A mean because of its chemical structure. See my organic chemistry playlist. Click the like button, click the subscribe button before I start wheezing. This is my pathology playlist. Please watch these videos in order for maximum understanding and retention. So what the flip is histamine? Histamine is an otocoid, which means paracrine or autocrine. Usually paracrine. You see it in the lungs, skin, GI tract. Where did it come from? From histidine. Who makes it? Mast cells, basophils, and platelets. And don't forget, the interochromaffin-like cells or ECLs. What triggers the histamine release? Type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. This is anaphylaxis. You have venoms, drugs, trauma. Histamine receptors include H1 and H2. H1 is GQ coupled, while H2 is GS coupled. Therefore, H1, GQ, phospholipase C, and then IP3, third number, third letter in the alphabet, and then calcium contraction of smooth muscles. And that's why histamine causes bronchoconstriction. No duh. How about H2? H2 is GS coupled, increases cyclic MP. And in your stomach, when you increase cyclic MP, you know what's gonna happen? You're going to release more hydrochloric acid. Is that all? Wait, we have more. We have H3 and H4 histamine receptors and they are GI coupled. I as in I hate you. Sorry, just came off of a hiatus after reading Schopenhauer the miserable philosopher who was weaned on a pickle. I stands for inhibitory, to tell you the truth. And if GS-coupled receptors tend to stimulate adenylate cyclase enzyme, therefore, we can say conversely, GI-coupled receptors tend to inhibit adenylate cyclase, and when you inhibit adenylate cyclase, ATP will not become cyclic AMP and will not give us protein kinase A. If you wish to see more videos like this in the future, drop an I emoji in the comments. Let's talk about them. H1 is GQ coupled, causes bronchoconstriction. And that's why in cases of anaphylaxis, you release too much histamine. Histamine is going to act on the H1 receptor, which is GQ coupled, which is going to contract because remember GQ calcium which is the hero of contraction of smooth muscles so you get bronchoconstriction and you develop wheezing during the anaphylactic shock and that's why one of the medications that can help mitigate the anaphylactic shock is an antihistaminic agent by antihistaminic we mean anti-h1 but if we want to inhibit h2 then we're gonna call the drug anti-H2 or H2 blocker rather than antihistaminic because when we say antihistaminic by convention we mean anti-H1 and it affects the endothelium and the CNS that's why H1 blockers cause sedation. H2 is GS coupled increases gastric acid secretion from the stomach parietal cells. Hashtag proton pump. The proton pump is going to pump the H or the proton towards the lumen or the cavity of the stomach but it's going to pump potassium in the opposite direction that's why we can argue that the parietal cell has a hydrogen potassium ATPase or a hydrogen potassium antiport or counter transport h3 and h4 are gi coupled h3 receptors are located in the cns and in the myenteric plexus please remember that the myenteric plexus is responsible for motility so we can argue logically that histamine plays a role in the motility of your intestines to be specific histamine is going to inhibit your intestinal motility i mean if you think that you're dying from an anaphylactic shock do you think we have time to waste 
worrying about the contraction of your intestines? No, of course we don't. So we're going to inhibit the motility of the GI tract. Moreover, H3 is very important for the nervous system. When histamine binds its H3 receptor, it can inhibit its own formation and its own secretion in the CNS. It's like a breaking mechanism. It's a negative feedback mechanism. Also, histamine might regulate sleep-wake cycles. Histamine and its H3 receptor have been implicated in Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, ADHD, and more. As for the H4 histaminic receptor, it's also GI-coupled. We find it in hematopoietic cells in the bone marrow and in other locations. H4 receptor is responsible for immune cell recruitment, for example, recruiting neutrophils during acute inflammation. This is known as neutrophilic chemotaxis. Please refer to my video on acute inflammation in this pathology playlist. It's also responsible for the sensation of pain and itching. And that's why allergies come with itching. Let's talk about histamine in the CNS. H1 and H2 receptors are postsynaptic, but H3 is presynaptic. What happens when you stimulate the H3 receptor, which is presynaptic? Oh, it causes presynaptic inhibition. It causes decrease of release of the neurotransmitter from the presynaptic neuron. This is going toast right now. Therefore, you're not releasing serotonin, you're not releasing norepinephrine or acetylcholine or dopamine or even GABA in your brain. H1, this is postsynaptic, if you remember, it's present in the hypothalamus, specifically the tubero mammillary neurons, and they are responsible for the circadian rhythm. If you stimulate H1 in your brain, you're awake. And that's why H1 blockers, the antihistamines, make you drowsy, especially the first generation. Moreover, stimulation of H1 at the cortex will make you excited. That's why H1 blockers will make you drowsy and sleepy and depressed. Now bring a piece of paper and doodle with medicosis. Let me take you to class. Please write this down. Histamine and bradykinin and serotonin have two things in common and you gotta be very careful these mediators tend to cause bronchoconstriction so the bronchi are going to constrict and you're going to wheeze and then wait for it these same three mediators are going to do the opposite in the blood vessels they are vasodilators for the most part so histamine and bradykinin and serotonin are bronchoconstrictors, but vasodilators. When I cause bronchoconstriction, what's going to happen to the radius of the bronchus? It's going to decrease. When radius decreases, what happens to resistance? Resistance increases. Why is this the case? It's the Poisier law. Remember, Poisier said this. Resistance equals 8 times the viscosity times the length of the vessel or the bronchus divided by pi because it's a circle the cross section of an artery a vein or a bronchus is a circle so we need pi and then radius raised to the fourth power from this we see that there is an inverse correlation between radius and resistance as the radius of the bronchus constricts resistance goes up and as resistance goes up what's going to happen to the flow of air through your bronchi it's going to decrease and you will have wheezing and you will have trouble breathing. And that's why anaphylactic shock is a freaking emergency. What should I do? What should I do? You should give epinephrine. What does epinephrine do? Epinephrine belongs to the sympathetic nervous system. It tends to be bronchodilator. So you're going to increase the radius of the bronchi, decrease the resistance of the bronchi, and improve the airflow so that you may breathe. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Next, histamine on blood vessels tend to be a vasodilator for the most part. So my vessels shall dilate. As they dilate, what's going to happen to the radius? The radius goes up. Therefore, what's going to happen to the resistance? Resistance decreases. And if you remember, blood pressure equals what? Cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. As resistance decreases, what happens to blood pressure? It decreases. So histamine tends to cause hypotension. And that's why patients with anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock tend to have low blood pressure. I've told you it makes sense. So the relationship between radius and resistance is Poisier law. But how about the 
opposite or the inverse relation between resistance and flow. Oh, that's a separate equation. It looks like this. Flow equals the difference in pressures, i.e. the bigger pressure minus the smaller pressure divided by the resistance. Oh, so there is an inverse correlation between resistance and flow. As resistance goes up, flow decreases in my bronchi and I wheeze. But when we give epinephrine, the opposite is going to happen. Resistance decreases and the flow is going to improve. It's called physics, baby. Something that most doctors suck at. Let's be honest. The only reason doctors went to medical school is because they suck at math. Shame. My Greek boy Plato used to say, let no one ignorant of geometry enter here. So you either get better at math or get the hell out of my house. I'm starting to sound like a boomer. Get off my lawn. And for the pros, let me tell you something very specific about histamine's relationship to the stomach. When histamine acts on H2 receptors, in the stomach's parietal cell, the stomach is going to respond by making more acid. Thank you, parietal cell. Thank you, proton pump. But when the same histamine acts on H3 histaminic receptor, something weird is going to happen. You're going to decrease the dufus. Who is the dufus? The dufus is somatostatin. Why do I call it the dufus? For two reasons. Number one, it's made by the delta cells of the pancreas. And it's a doofus. It inhibits everything. It even inhibits its own secretion. So when histamine decreases the doofus, when you decrease the inhibitor, when you remove the inhibitor, you tend to make more of what you want to make. In this case, you're going to make more HCL. So histamine increases gastric acid secretion by two mechanisms. Number one, by directly binding its H2 receptor on the parietal cell of the stomach, and number two, by indirectly inhibiting somatostatin release, which will in turn raise HCL level. H1 receptor, what's the ligand? Histamine. How about H2 receptor? The ligand is also histamine. H1, GQ coupled. H2, GS coupled. When you're GQ, it's calcium, baby. You're causing bronchoconstriction. When you're GS, you'll increase cyclic MP. In the gut, it will increase hydrogen potassium ATPase, which will secrete more HCL. Tons of acid in your stomach. Where did this histamine come from? Mast cells and basophils. But where did this histamine come from? From enterochromaffin-like cells. And that's huge. What's the function of histamine on the H1 receptor anaphylaxis and shock? So, on the endothelium, it boosts nitric oxide synthase, giving you vasodilation and hypotension. It increases calcium because it's GQ, and this will contract the pericytes, increase capillary permeability, causing edema. How about the bronchi? Calcium bronchoconstriction. The gut smooth muscles, calcium contraction of those muscles, peripheral nerves, pain and itching. Ew, allergy, anaphylaxis. Ew. On the atrioventricular node or the AV node, it decreases conduction, causing bradycardia. If you take it too far, you get heart block. So histamine on the H1 receptor is acting on bronchi vessels and in the inner ear for motion sickness. The drugs that inhibit this are called antihistamines or H1 blockers such as diphenhydramine, meclizine, etc. On the other hand, stimulation of H2 receptor will increase gastric acid secretion, it will increase the firing rate of the SA node causing tachycardia, and it will increase the contraction of the atrial and ventricular muscles. Where do you find H2 receptors? In the stomach, especially parietal cells, because these are the cells that make your acid. They also make intrinsic factor for vitamin B12, if you remember. Drugs that inhibit H2 receptors are cimetidine, famotidine, ranitidine, nizitidine. If you want to learn more about the enterochromaffin-like cells, please watch my video on gastric motility and secretion in my physiology playlist. Let's talk about the medications that block histamine receptors. We have two groups of these. We have medications that, that block H1, also we, known as antihistamines, and we have drugs that block H2. We call them H2 blockers. But when a doctor says, I want to give antihistamines, they are not talking about H2 at all. They are usually referring to H1 only. When you block the H1, the medication is anti-allergy, anti-congestant, anti-motion sickness, anti-emetic, anti-insomnia. When you prescribe an H2 blocker, it's antipeptic ulcer, anti-reflux disease, or anti-gastritis. H1 blockers could be neutral antagonists or inverse agonists. 
What are the side effects of H1 blockers, sedation and weight gain, especially with the first generation? They are also anti-muscarinic and anti-alpha adrenergic. They block the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Example of H1 blockers, diphenhydramine, diminhydrinate, etc. Examples of H2 blockers is simetidine, ranitidine, famotidine, nizatidine, etc. Simetidine, ranitidine, famotidine, nizatidine. Beautiful. You can learn about antihistamines in a video titled Antihistaminics, and you can learn about the H2 blockers in my video on peptic ulcer disease medications. Both of these videos are in my pharmacology playlist. Or you can simply download my Utacoids pharmacology course on my website medicosisperfectionalis.com. It will teach you about H1 antagonists, H2 blockers, the story of bradykinin, the story of serotonin, medications for asthma, medications for COPD and cystic fibrosis, and much more. Go to medicosisperfectionalis.com. It comes with videos, notes, and cases. If you value what I do, help me make more videos by supporting the channel. Go to buymeacoffee.com slash medicosis. There are more than 750 premium videos available on this channel when you click the join button and choose the highest tier. Please subscribe, hit the bell, smash like, support my channel on Patreon, PayPal, or Venmo. Go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases, or if you would like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine, chemistry, math, and physics make perfect sense.